Sam Gershman uh, is a professor in the Department of Psychology and S the Center for Brain Science at Harvard. His lab uses a combination of behavioral, neuroimaging, and computational techniques to better understand how structured knowledge about environments is acquired, but also uh, how that knowledge relates to adaptive behavior. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Here's Sam. All right, thanks, and uh, thanks, Ginny. That's always great to, to hear what Ginny's been up to. I'm primarily a cognitive scientist, but today I'm going to talk about AI, and in particular, I'm going to give you a kind of whirlwind tour of um, our efforts over the last half decade or so to build theory-based reinforcement learning systems, and I'll explain what that is. And there's lots of also, I'll say, interesting cognitive science stuff in this space that I'm not going to talk about today. And the reason I'm talking about theory-based reinforcement learning in this symposium is because games have played an important role in the development of these systems. As we already heard, human learning efficiency and flexibility are remarkable. And it's been a long-standing goal in machine learning AI to capture these properties in machines. And we're using video games as a testbed for studying a unified approach to natural and artificial intelligence. So that means that we're developing algorithms that are supposed to be solutions to engineering problems, right? But we're also, those are also doubling as cognitive models, right? And we, wa we want to think about AI systems that learn to play games like humans do. Our starting point for thinking about these games, and, and it's very much connects to, to what your, Johnny was just talking about a moment ago, is that we think that when people are faced with the kinds of games that we're, we're talking about here, we think that uh, they're learning to solve those problems and, and other related problems by building domain-specific intuitive theories. Okay, so these are theories that are supposed to be kind of like scientific theories structurally, but their content relates to our understanding, our intuitive understanding, as opposed to you know, the understanding of some expert in the scientific domain. And in particular, part of what uh, makes a theory a theory is that it's typically capturing the causal laws governing interactions between objects and agents. And I'm just putting a few examples from, from the literature on, on intuitive theories to give you a sense of what kinds of intuitive theories people are interested in. You know, one of these figures is from a, a paper from Laura and Josh you're going to hear from today. The specific kind of intuitive theories that we're interested in are supposed to be theories of reinforcement learning problems. So these are, these are sequential decision problems where the goal is to optimize long-term reward. And a big thing that makes us, these kinds of problems hard is that the state space, particularly in domains like video games, is vast. And in a theory-based approach, the idea is that we're going to learn the underlying causal laws and then use this knowledge to plan. And so it's a form of model-based reinforcement learning, if you're familiar with that term. But in this case, we're making pretty strong claims about the kind of structured model class that we're interested in. So at a very high level, this is the way we think theory-based reinforcement learning works. First, you're taking some input and using your perceptual system to turn that into something like a symbolic description of the domain. We've actually punted on perception for a lot of the stuff that we've done, but obviously, eventually, you need some kind of perceptual front end. The symbolic descriptions are supposed to be the input to a theory induction system or program synthesis system where the theory describes the causal laws governing that uh, game. And then once you have that theory, you can use it to plan and explore that domain. Right? So you can, you can use it, for example, as a simulator to plan using rollouts. You can use it to define theory-based sub-goals, like what's that object over there? I don't know how it works. I'm going to generate a plan to go and interact with it to understand it better. And our first foray into this culminated in, in this model that you guys actually heard about in the first talk, the EMPA agent, Explore Model Plan agent. I'm not going to go into the details of this because I'm going to focus on some more recent things, but I just want to give an example of the kind of theories that this model produces. They were, in our original work, restricted to what's called the video game description language, which is that can actually be used to produce many, a large class of games. And we've still been very interested in this kind of class of games that can be written in this language, but we're also trying to, to go beyond uh, and think about a broader distribution of games. The thing that um, to take away from these kinds of, from our early results, you, you guys already saw this, or at least part of this figure, is that when you use a theory-based reinforcement learning system like EMPA, you can actually produce learning curves that look remarkably like human learning curves and produce much higher learning efficiency compared to at least the, the kinds of deep learning systems that, um, that we evaluated in this study. But I want to point out there are two important challenges here. So one is, how do we efficiently infer theories from data, and how do we efficiently use the theories to plan, reason, and imagine? And those were two big stumbling blocks for our, our, our earlier work, because the inference machinery was extremely slow, and that calls into question sort of the scalability of the approach. Also, the, the planning machinery was rather slow, right? So we, we need to think about how we can efficiently use theories, possibly at multiple levels of abstraction. And so that, that's what led us to um, the development of a system that we call Theory Coder that separates low-level and high-level aspects of theories. And by the way, the, the person who did a lot of this work, Zergum, is, is here today. And if you have 
um, detailed questions, you can talk to him after this as well. The basic idea here is that the low level describes the game mechanics. So where does my avatar go, for example, when I press the up button? And we're going to allow that low level description of the game mechanics to be extremely expressive. So we, any function that we can write in Python, essentially. We put stronger constraints on the high level. So we, the high level includes abstract predicates and operators like go to or pick up or inside. And those are expressed in a specific planning language called PDDL. And, and I've shown here an example of, the, of, of an expression in PDDL for a move to operator. And then we can take advantage of this bipartite distinction between low and high level to use uh, very optimized bi-level planning algorithms uh, that take advantage of that hierarchical structure. So the idea is basically at the high level, you choose a goal to plan to, right? and then you use some kind of low-level planning algorithm. And in this case, we showed that it can work even with very dumb low-level planners like Breadth First Search to actually realize that, that sub-goal. And then the other part of this is that we can use LLMs to infer theories efficiently. And I want to emphasize that we're not using LLMs here to produce plans or policies. We're using LLMs as one tool within this system where we can give it tokenized data about the gameplay history and it can produce theories written in Python. And I'll shortly describe how we can use that also to produce the abstractions as well. So this is the, the general view of what, how Theory Coder works. So there's abstract knowledge uh, that we think of as transferable that, that presumably, if we were thinking about how humans learn, these are abstractions that are learned across many different games and domains. But when you go into a particular game, you need to figure out how to ground those abstractions in the mechanics of that specific game. And so there's some game-specific learning that has to be learned. That's the low-level learning where we, we describe the game mechanics in, in Python code. And then, as I said, you, you have these, these high-level and low-level descriptions, which you can then combine into a, a high-level planner that allows very efficient production of um, action sequences. As you get more observations, your, the, the LLM, which is producing the actual theory, can, will revise its, its theories, um, so you'll see some updating. So one of the, the case studies that we focused a lot on is this game Baba is You. If you haven't seen it before, I, I recommend you check it out. It's quite cool. One of the cool things about Baba is You is that you can actually change the game mechanics through the agent actions. So you can, for example, push the word rock into a next to rock to is flag, and that produces a new rule that turns the rock into a flag. So here's an example of, of what happens in Theory Coder when, when that happens. So you push the rock into the flag, it encounters an error because it's surprised by the fact that the rock turned into the flag, and that prompts the LLM to revise its theory. We've evaluated this on, on Bob as you. That's what, what's called Kiki competition here, but also on a, on a range of other games, including Sokoban, which Junyu was just talking about. In this particular setting, we compared it against a kind of direct application of LLM, where we just asked the LLM to produce plans. And you can see two things from this. So one is that if you just try to make the, get the LLM to play the task directly, you get a high rate of failure. We already saw with the, 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 um, the new challenge, video game challenges, right? And then the other thing is that Theory Coder succeeds almost uh, perfectly, at least on these games, and it does it with many fewer API calls, right? Because the, the rate limiting factor here is actually how often it has to call the LLM API. And you can see that it does it, it can do it with only a handful of times and get the right answer. The last thing I want to talk about before finishing, and this is kind of still a bit of a work in progress, is how we could actually learn the abstractions with the LLM. So that what I showed you just now are results where we actually hand engineered the abstractions. And so the LLM was only inferring the low level game mechanics. But We've done more recent work to show that we can actually, through a kind of game curriculum, learn the abstractions themselves and build a kind of almost fully autonomous system. So the only thing that we're giving it are a few examples of basically a PDDL for some simple toy examples so that the LM knows what format to write the high level abstractions in. And then it can kind of just do it. It can, figure, it can write the, the expressions in PDL, and then we can run the same system that I showed you before. And here again, what you see is this combination of really fast compute time, because you only need a relatively few LM calls, and then our, the hierarchy permits fast hierarchical planning, and then very high success rate compared to naive applications of LMs. And also, I don't have time to describe all the other baselines we did, but sort of more sophisticated versions of LMs trying to play these games. So let me wrap up. The main takeaway here is that theory-based reinforcement learning is a scalable solution to at least this kind of problem. We're not saying that theory-based reinforcement learning is going to be, you know, be a solution to all problems that an intelligent agent faces, right? But we think that for video games, which are kind of microcosms of an important subclass of problems for intelligent agents, we think that this kind of approach works, is scalable, and also we think it's human-like. And if I had more time, I'd tell you about the, the human data that would back up that kind of claim. And so key to the success is the construction of an intermediate theory and multiple levels of extraction. So you can't take a shortcut and just have the LM output the plan directly. 
It's this intermediate hierarchical representation that supports bi-level planning, which seems to be really uh, key here. I'll just list a few of our future directions. We, we'd like to build systems that can learn from pixels, richer world models that include physics and social interaction, and systems that can perform analogical generalization. So generalizing not just to new levels of the same game, but to other kinds of games that might share some structural similarities with the games that have already been learned. Uh, and with that, I'll thank my collaborators, and thanks for listening. Yeah.